So welcome to this uh, first lecture of the image analysis and uh, computer vision course. So today we have kind of a introduction, a lay back uh, lecture. First of all, we will have three lectures for this course. So there are professors uh, and the Koglu, myself, and also Professor Fisher Yu who will uh, be teaching. We have a course text for you, but uh, that is in fact meant as uh, complementary material. The slide decks that will be provided for all the lectures are the actual reference uh, that you can use for study. So the course text will be missing some parts, so do not restrict your studying to the course text. There is a, another computer vision course at uh, Informatics, uh, the Computer Science Department. And it's important that you do not take both this course and that course. So I would say, in order to help you choose, if you took the introductory course on computer vision at uh, the Computer Science Department, then best take the computer vision course there. If you did not take that introductory course, it's probably better to take this course as it's more self-contained. Okay, so from here we can dive into the real material. Today we will have three parts. In order to study computer vision, so the analysis of images with computers, it certainly makes sense to also look at uh, human perception and to draw some conclusions from that. So that's the first part. Then the second part is kind of a motivation. Why be bothered with computer vision in the first place? So we will show a number of example applications where computer vision is used today. And then finally, we will uh, have to discuss light because without light, no vision. Okay. So then we can start with the first part, uh, human perception. So if you look at nature, you see that vision is one of these very important sensors. Looking in particular to humans, you will see that almost half our brains, almost half our cells in the brain, the neurons, are dealing with vision one way or another. So that's already a sign of how important vision is for people. Actually, vision, the visual sense, have developed several times during evolution, again, pointing at its importance. One big advantage it has is that it's fully non-contact. So you see the tiger without first having to touch it. And that is, of course, important. You can see from a large distance, actually. It can also be implemented with high resolution. So the direction from where a danger may be coming, of where a prey is found, uh, that direction can be determined with high precision. Whereas, for instance, uh, if you look at uh, the oral sense, so um, hearing, it is far less precise in determining those directions. And in a way, it comes for free because vision uses electromagnetic waves, waves by which we are surrounded anyway the light coming from the sun, as we will see. Vision also gives us very rich information. We can see different aspects of the environment, like the color of objects, the texture, so the pattern on their surfaces. We can estimate with the two eyes that we have how far away objects are. We can see how they move and we can analyze the shape 
of the objects surrounding us. So, a very rich source of information indeed. So, the central take-home message from this is vision is damn important for humans. And for good reasons, because it has so many advantages coming with it. That said, if you look at perception, there are a number of uh, intriguing observations to be made. Namely that we hardly measure the reality surrounding us, just like that, like a passive measurement process. Take, for instance, this example. We have these different uh, rectangles. They have each their own intensity. So we have black, white, but then also these two levels of grey. In reality, though, these two levels of grey are identical. But depending on the surrounding intensity, that is not the impression that you get. So it is like our visual system gets fooled by this pattern. But another and probably more positive way of looking at this is there's a lot of processing and interpretation going on in our brain. Much more than just passive capturing and measurement. So intensity, of course, is a very, very basic property uh, of our surroundings. And you can look at others and observe identical issues. But let's take first the example of color. So here we have a color pattern. You see these different balls, different spheres. Uh, red ones, or reddish ones, bluish ones, greenish ones. In reality though, all these balls have identical colors. So they are all the same color. Even if our impression would be a very different one. So again, something that would look very straightforward to measure, something very basic. We had intensity, here we have color. And again, our visual system, it seems, can get fooled so easily. If we take away all the surrounding colors here and just focus on the three balls at the top and take a small part where you don't have these horizontal colored lines intersecting them, we get the following. So here you can see much clearer that indeed all three balls have the same color. In the original pattern, they look quite different though. Okay, intensity, color, nothing seems to be safe. Well, neither is length, as a matter of fact. So if you look at A, you have these two horizontal lines with these arrows at the end. The two horizontal lines have equal length. But probably the impression you get is that the line on top is shorter than the one, one at the bottom. And the same for B and also the uh, space between the arrow tips in C. So also in terms of length, we as humans don't seem to be such fantastic uh, objective observers. Okay, here we have lines that are straight, the horizontal lines in the top left figure, for instance. We have a square bottom left, and we have these checkable patterns with nice rows and columns all straight on the right hand side. Nonetheless, all these straight curves seem to be, well, straight lines seem to be curved. Another basic observation down the drain, so it seems. Here we have sets of parallel lines. Top left, we have the parallel diagonal lines on the top right. And then we have this uh, rectangle parallel to the base rectangle on top. And again, we are fooled in believing that these lines are actually far from parallel. And you can go on and on like that. Uh, in the end, you might wonder whether 
vision is useful at all, given all the mistakes we seem to make. So here we have uh, a bunch of spirals. Or are they? Actually, these are not spirals at all. These are all circles. And here we have one of those and another. And you can follow these circles around and see that indeed these are all circular patterns. But it didn't seem so at the start. Motion. So this barber pole illusion gives us the impression of an upward motion. So we have the impression of a vertical motion. Whereas we know all too well that what must happen in reality here is that a cylinder with a pattern on is just spinning about a vertical axis. So the real motion is actually horizontal and not vertical at all. So also motion uh, can lead to mistakes. Back to intensity here. And an example that uh, shows the importance of context. So what we have here is a ring, this gray ring in the center. And you see at the top we have the black background and below we have this grayish background. But the intensity within that ring is constant. Now what we will do is to kind of disconnect the top of the ring from the bottom by introducing two horizontal lines. And that's the only change we will make. So here we go. We have added two small horizontal lines disconnecting the top and the bottom of the ring. But we see that uh, the change that is introduced by this is more global, because now it seems like the top half of the ring is brighter than the bottom half of that ring. But that's absolutely an illusion again. But you see that the surroundings influence our, our impression, our perception of intensity. So removing these two horizontal lines and everything goes back to the start. It's a very strong uh, illusion. Yet more of this, so we have, in this case, four black squares and then the middle square is white, as you can see here. And now we'll show something very similar, but with some gradients, some changes in intensity. So still the center is just the same white as before. And we start from the same black at the uh, extreme boundaries of the surrounding darker squares. But by introducing this uh, gradient, we suggest kind of a glare. And it's difficult to believe that the center this time is not brighter than it was before. Another, maybe even more intriguing example of this, where indeed context plays a role again. So we have this checkable pattern, and then we have an object placed on top that casts a shadow onto the checkerboard. Look at these two squares, A and B. Clearly, A is one of the darker squares of the checkable pattern, and B one of the brighter ones. But in reality, both have the same intensity. We are made to believe they have not, because we make this overall holistic interpretation of one part B actually lying in the shadow and A in full light. And that leads us to making that mistake. But objectively, A and B have the same intensity. And we'll show that by isolating them. So there you go. These two levels of grey are actually identical. Okay. So contact plays a very important uh, role. Here we have this previous example. You are made to believe that the top rectangle must actually tilt over to the right because there is this weight on the right. Right. Again, we are bringing in physics, physical expectations about the scene. In reality, everything is parallel.
And this is a nice example of how our visual system is even able to fill in. And that's maybe a point where we start to see what are, are these illusions actually for. Our visual system is, of course, meant to operate in the real world. And if you look, look at the top, there you have this uh, word read, right? But actually, objectively, the only thing that is happening here is that you have a number of uh, black areas on a white background. But we complete these characters, R, E, A, D, in our heads, because there are no lines to really complete them in the figure. This is also seen in uh, this pattern at the bottom, where you have these three Pac-Man figures on the left, and then, um, yeah, this kind of triangle being formed by these three. Again, experiments have been done with human uh, perceivers, and people will report that they see the triangle in the center being brighter than the background, which, of course, is absolute nonsense. But again, we fill in virtual boundaries for that foreground triangle to build a figure. Same on the bottom right, we see again this central triangle being uh, completed in our minds, even with the illusion that it's brighter than the background, which is of course, again, not true. But this is a, definitely a functional advantage that the system has. It can almost like see boundaries, transitions between one object and another, one object and a background, for instance, where there are no real contrast levels to be seen, no edges. So here's an example of that, right? So we have a number of black dots on this uh, wide background. Now, actually, there is an object in here. And when confronted with this pattern for the first time, people often find it difficult to detect the object. Also, I have to say, once you have seen this example once in your life, you will remember it for years without a problem. So in case you haven't seen this uh, image yet, here is where the object is. So what we have here is a Dalmatian dog. And to make that clear, here would be like the snout. Here is one of the ears of the dog. Here you go, go to the shoulder. That's the back. This is one hind leg. This is the other hind leg here. And that is the third leg and third leg here. Fourth leg. And that is belly. It may take you some time to detect it. But, yeah. but if you can detect an object like that at all, it's because your mind is actually filling in all the missing contours of this foreground object of the Dalmatian dog, in this case. So that's an example of filling in. In the brain, actually, cells have been found that respond to virtual edges. So edges that should be there, maybe, because it's a transition between the object and the background, but are actually not found as a contrast of intensity. Nonetheless, these cells indicate the presence of an edge, of a boundary. So this is also a neurophysiological counterpart to these illusions, actually. But you see the use of it, right? You can fill in the pattern, pull it out of the background by this filling in process that um, it's kind of an illusion, if you want. Another example of the role of context is this one. So we have four scenes here. And yeah, they are kind of blurry. But nonetheless, as a human, you can try to make out what's in it. So we'll probably be rather successful at it. So top left, you have people sitting around the table. And on that table, you have a plate and you have a, a bottle of some kind. Then top right, you have a, a guy driving a car. And he's using his mobile phone, which she shouldn't do, of course. Um, but anyway, that's what we see there. And then bottom left, you have 
a street scene, it seems with a car parked or, or driving there at the left hand side, and then something standing uh, on, on the right in front. Here, bottom right, you have a person kneeling, doing something. And yeah, you can also make that out pretty well. So, focusing on some of these patterns that we have. Here we have a bottle and a plate. Here we have a mobile phone. Here we have a car. And, well, maybe a person walking there. Here we have a shoe. So, we can interpret the, all these objects, even if I have very little detail, to recognize them from. Now, all these images have actually been manipulated a bit. And the patterns that you see here in these circles are all identical. They are absolute copies of each other. Namely, that's the basic pattern. Just a blob of some kind. A blob that we gave interpretations that are vastly different, depending on context. The context gave the meaning. We take one of these images as the example. So, that is a person walking. And then we move the pattern. It becomes a car. Now, the conclusion from this is that, indeed, human uh, vision is much more than a bottom-up process of the sequence signal processing. The entire context plays a very big role, and there must be some kind of feedback process from a high-level interpretation back downwards to make these local interpretations of the different parts of the scene. So the central take-home message of this part is that uh, Effective vision needs more than sheer filtering and measuring. Successful vision is not just a mere bottom-up process, a sequence of filtering operations. Expectations feed into this. Humans know about the world. Their expectations influence their interpretation of images. And information is gathered from all around the image, even when it comes to very local decisions about what is being found there. 